This area is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. There's all these shipwrecks out there. 27 men are never seen again. Nothing has ever been recovered. There are so many theories about the Bermuda Triangle. The only way you're going to be able to solve this is if you hit each one of them head on. And that's what we're going to do. We have the intel from 30 years of the position of shipwrecks lost in the Bermuda Triangle. I found something over here. I've never seen this on an aircraft before. I think something for space. You've discovered Challenger. You're speechless. Wayne! How you doing, Wayne? Good, Kevin. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good. You are a, a really well-known producer of other things. I and mean, we're going to get into the new show, but I watch your stuff all the time on the History Channel. You're a big um, history buff. I became a history buff. I mean, just sold one show to History Channel, I don't know, or History Television up in Canada, History Channel in the States, about 20 so years ago. And then I just had this run um, of just doing a lot of military docs, a lot of World War II, a lot of World War I, shipwreck films, a lot of investigative um, stories, getting into some mysteries about World War II and one. Well, I'm Wayne Abbott. I'm the producer and director of Dieppe Uncovered from a company called Northern Sky Entertainment. Dieppe Uncovered is a brand new film about the raid on Dieppe, which took place on August 19, 1942. Um, it is single-handedly the worst day in military history for Canadians. Over 900 Canadians were killed in a couple of hours. Most films leading you know, before this one has really dealt with you know, the Canadians and the tragedy that happened on the beaches, but never really got into the intent of the raid. This film gets into new characters, new intentions, and it really gets to uh, a central core of the raid that has never been uncovered. So, yeah, it, it was kind of like I, I just stumbled into it, but I loved it. I mean, I began in sports years ago, and then um, getting into doing war stories, it's like, you hate to say it, well, I always describe it as the ultimate game. Um, so I kind of became fascinated and just felt like so many stories needed to be told so that we would remember what went on during, uh, you know, the, the two world wars, plus we've done Afghanistan. I'd, I've never done a, a show on Vietnam, but I'd like to. Um, but yeah, it just became a big part of our lives. Um, and as I was saying with sports, there's the same thing, man versus man, man versus environment, man versus himself. And that's like the, the ultimate thing in war. Um, so very personal, but uh, the ultimate game, because it could cost you your life, not just losing, but it could cost you your life. So I was, I was fascinated. So I did, yeah, I did a lot of military. And I think one of the pieces that I actually remember watching, you did, uh, you, you really wanted to find the uh, torpedo bombers. Yes. It was the last flight that was required by the cadets before graduation. The flight leader said that both of his compasses on board his aircraft were inoperable. All five planes experienced equipment malfunctions. And then all five disappeared from radar. And that yes. led you to this show. Can you explain all that? Like This show is all about the Bermuda Triangle, so. Yeah, just, well, one, I've always been fascinated with the Bermuda Triangle, but I didn't go out and try to just tell a Bermuda Triangle story. Um, over the years, I became fascinated with Flight 19, which uh, was five Avenger torpedo bombers that left Fort Lauderdale Air Force Base on December 5th, 1945, never to be seen again. Um, and then there was a sixth plane. It was a, um, a uh, rescue plane. We just call it the Martin Mariner because that was the type of plane it was. It went out to search for those planes and it disappeared. So in total, 27 men disappeared that night, presumed dead. That Martin Mariner also failed to return to base. It is so bizarre for us to try to comprehend 27 U.S. Navy sailors lost their lives. They disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle, and there has still never been an adequate explanation for what happened to them. So it's a, this was 1945, so this is before anybody even came up with the myth Bermuda Triangle. Um, but it's such a tragic event, and 
nobody's found the planes and I became kind of obsessed with it back around 2016 which then turned into a two-hour special where I was part of a team, including Professor David O'Keefe, who's been kind of like my on-camera partner for years. And we were part of this team trying to find Flight 19, as well as the Martin Mariner. Um, we didn't do it, but we did a, you know, we were working with a company called Lone Wolf Media out of Portland, Maine, and they did a great job in producing the, the two-hour special which then turned into a six part series that we have now. And again, even though it's tied up in the Bermuda Triangle, this is a six part you know, series where we're really trying to find new and unknown wrecks in the triangle. So it's a shipwreck film, a plane wreck film, plus all the mysteries and intrigue um, dealing with the legends and myths of the Bermuda Triangle. So it's quite an interesting kind of show. Well, can you explain to some people, very few people actually, that wouldn't know about the Bermuda Triangle? In fact, I don't think, I think everybody knows about it, but can you define it? Like, is it a certain place and do they know what's happening or is it just a myth or? Well, the Bermuda Triangle, there's there's no solid boundary. It's not like a country or anything. It's, it's an imaginary line that extends from, you know, basically the bottom of the, of the island of Bermuda down to the tip of Florida over to Puerto Rico and back up. And talking to whatever, whoever, there's, there's really no defined boundaries, but it's kind of loosely that. Um, I mean, I think the myth just came up in the early 60s. Uh, a lot of it had to do with this Flight 19 story. That was really the catalyst, because that was really the most bizarre out of all the stories how these planes just disappeared. Um, but then when you combine it with all the ships um, and people that just went missing within this area. Um, you can see why somebody labeled it Bermuda Triangle. Um, but is there any truth to it? I mean, that's part of the fun of our show. I mean, we have this adventurous part where our divers go down, and even I get to go down. I'd like to talk a bit more about it later, but I even got to go down in submersibles for the first time to actually see shipwrecks for the first time around 600 feet down. Um, so you get that aspect of it, but we do every, almost every show we kind of delve into, especially Dave and I, um, into the mysteries, um, that have been associated with, uh, the triangle. So we look at rogue waves, methane gas, um, even UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. Might the Bermuda Triangle be an electromagnetic hotspot where portals capable of manipulating time open and close? Ancient astronaut theorists say yes, and they believe that these portals may help explain some of the strange, otherworldly activity reported in the area. So we have that aspect to the show, but at the other time, we find wrecks, we try to identify them, and even some we've brought families together, so even that emotional part is in it. Um, so I think it's a, it's a show that will deliver, I think, to a lot of different you know, people be co-viewing, men, women. I think children will love it. Kids will love it. So I'm hoping everybody tunes in and, and just kind of uh, goes on our uh, goes on our journey with us or take our journey, take the journey that we're on and enjoy it. Well, the storyline of the first episode, that is a journey. That is a story because it was never supposed to be, uh, it, it wasn't written, it wasn't scripted. No. But what happened? No. Well, it's like any, I've done so many shipwreck films, half the time you go down, you never find what you want to find. <laughs> and that's what happened here. We were searching off the coast of Florida, where our divers were, I wasn't out on the boat at this point. Um, they were searching for this Martin Mariner rescue plane that disappeared on December 5th, 1945. Um, and they had numerous targets and our lead diver, Michael Barnett has been trying to find the Martin Mariner for years. So part of the series is that he has a whole slew of targets and we're trying to, you know, um, I, I we're trying to go down or trying to dive on these, these targets that he has. So that's what they were doing back in March. They were just doing bounce dives because they're in shallower water, just trying to find, because he had these targets and just to go down and, and see whether or not it looked like, because he was searching for, because a Martin Mariner was supposed to have exploded. Um, so he was literally searching for smaller bits 
because it might have been an engine or a wing or or, or um, something. So that's where he came across his target. And they went down and they come across what is best described when you see the images of a tile floor, because that's what it looks like. And so they took the sand away and they started to kind of go, well, could this be um, uh, a piece of Challenger? And they did a second dive. And then once they felt um, themselves that this might be a piece of Challenger, then they uh, went through a very strict protocol. Like we didn't announce it. We kept it quiet. Um, we went to NASA until they, NASA to, to have them identify it. And once they identified it, we just let them control the narrative. So that's why, you know, they went to all the families just to say, look, this is what's happened. Um, a piece of the Challenger was found and they, they made the announcement less than two weeks ago. Um, and to be honest, we've just been shocked and by the reaction, like media around the world has uh, talked to various members of our team um, because you just realize the Challenger wasn't just an American story. You know, it affected everybody. When that shuttle lifts off, all of America will be reminded of the crucial role that teachers and education play in the life of our nation. 11,000 teachers actually applied to go to space. On July 19, 1985, Excited Vice President Bush yeah. makes the big announcement. The teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. Or is, is that you? <laughs> Krista McAuliffe was a civics and history teacher. She was 37, a mother of a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, a wife. She was a perfect figure for publicity. McAuliffe's mission was scheduled for January, only six months away. The anticipation and publicity surrounding a teacher in space will add pressure to keep this mission on schedule. And that pressure will have consequences. Challenger. 60 seconds in, the Challenger reaches 35,000 feet at speeds of Mach 1.5. Everything appears smooth until it doesn't. A minute 15 seconds, velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Flight 
Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. You know, especially if you're over 40, you remember where you were when that exploded. Um, so it was a defining moment, I think, in everyone's lives. And uh, it's just been, you know, it was a special artifact to find, but it's been a humbling um, artifact to find as well. Now, it's interesting. I, I think everybody knows about the Challenger, but, but you, I'm old enough to remember that day. Like uh, millions of us remember that. Yes, day. same here. <laughs> yeah, and it was you know the teacher dying too, and actually uh, wasn't it the story mm -hmm. John Denver wanted to be in that flight, and then he didn't he didn't get chosen. Well, I guess that you probably know by now. I was one who wanted to fly. I wanted to ride on that. Fire right up into heaven. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't think, know about Joe, and so. I, I don't know, but everybody knows about the, the school teacher, and I think that got a lot of press. And, you know, it's you, you go back, and this is the first time I kind of relived it as well. Um, once we found it, I went back and looked at some of the old footage and even the live broadcast, and it's haunting because not only you see all the families there, um, but even the the you know the people in uh, at NASA when they're they're at uh, what do you call it the headquarters or whatever at uh, Mission Control when it exploded there was a pause. I mean it just nobody could really comprehend what they were seeing right away and it took took a while for them to just kind of say you know Challenger exploded. Ronald Reagan postpones the State of the Union address for the first time ever, and instead gives one of his most memorable speeches. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. because it was just something that, of course, nobody expected. But then the follow-up is just that it was a series of, you know, errors and the space shuttle shouldn't have taken off at that time. But uh, it was nice. It was nice to find the piece. Not only, of course, look, we, it's great promotion for our show, but even more importantly, it brought Challenger back. And then you would see other networks everywhere. Yeah, they would cover our little story, but then they would cover and they would do a bigger story on Challenger. And, you know, for people under 40, um, they were able to maybe understand it more and it brought it back, brought the story back so people don't forget it. And isn't that what history is all about? Is that why you're in so mm -hmm. uh, enthralled with history? I mean, some people would say, well, why yeah. you see the future? Why always are you dwelling into your career and your your uh, motivation into the, into the past? I just think the past. I mean, as a, you know, as I mentioned with World War Two and World War One. I mean, there's so many stories that deserve to be told. Um, and there's just certain things that just can't be forgotten. And we always say, you know, that when we deal with the Great War and World War II, but something like Challenger, 9-11, these things should always be at the forefront. Um, and it's just as a storyteller, and that's what I am mostly as a producer, director, writer, cinematographer. Now I am so happen to be on, in front of the camera. Um, it's important for me to tell stories and it's just stuff that affects you. Um, and even though we're doing, people go, oh, you're doing the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, you know, the Bermuda Triangle is there. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating myth um, and legend, but we're also, that's not really, that's only part of our story because we are uncovering, like we've come, what have we, we've come across? Uh, you'll, you'll see things from the 1950s that we find, 1960s, something from around the turn of the century. Um, every time our divers went down um, or our dive team went down um, and checked out the seabed, we came across something totally fascinating. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting to kind of, you know, tell these stories and bring, yeah, bring the past to the forefront again. But they are fascinating, story, fascinating stories, and uh, I just love telling them. And I think you know, all of us who are part of Into Cursed Waters, um, we're all fascinated with history and shipwrecks and plane wrecks and telling these stories. 
I love the idea there were so many fish around you and they didn't really care if you were there. And sort of also showed that the future of uh, ecology is the, the fish find all these uh, pieces of UFOs or whatever you find down there. They're, 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 they're <laughs> UFOs. <laughs> Well, you'll have to watch all six episodes to see whether we find a UFO. But our, our lead diver, Michael Barnett, it's one of the stories you see here all the time. Um, and I was lucky enough to spend almost a week and a half out on a research vessel uh, in May searching deeper water uh, with this extraordinary ship called the Odyssey. Um, so we had all of the high tech so we could um, do multi-beam and map the floor, see a target. And then we had these great subs that we could go down and, and I was able to, uh, I was able to do two submersible dives on two ships that had never been found before. So these were extraordinary, but the, the, the one story that keeps popping up is where the fish are is where the wrecks are. If there's fish, there's a wreck. And, uh, you see it, you see the storyline keep coming up, um, even when uh, Michael Barnett and I did our uh, did the first submersible dive down to this unknown wreck, um, it was so murky and and we were right in the Gulf Stream that our um, our sub got taken half a kilometer away from the wreck, and it took us ninety minutes to to find the wreck um, because it, we had to go so slow. But wouldn't you know it? Right when we saw the fish, we knew we were near the wreck. Um, so even though with all the high tech gear. Where there's fish, there's something there, and a lot of a lot of times it uh, it, it was the wreck. So it was a uh, you'll see that storyline pop up a lot. That's funny. Now, no, I, Wayne, I know that everybody's going to want me to ask you this question, even though it's a silly question. You probably don't want me to ask it, but I got to ask it. Are you paranoid diving at the Bermuda Triangle? I mean, you're looking for all these yeah. people that died. God. Yeah, I, well, some people died, some people didn't. Uh, definitely shipwrecks that have gone down and sometimes very bizarre circumstances, but no. I mean, I'm quite fascinated. I did a, a story uh, a few years ago on the Bermuda Triangle, so I've been fascinated. I mean, I mean, I'm late 50s, so I grew up with Close Encounters, Chariots of the Gods, you know, the documentary that, you know, was really the first one to kind of investigate you know, some of our ancient engineering with potential um, help from extraterrestrials, um, close encounters, all this stuff. So, I mean, I've been fascinated uh, with the triangle, but scared, no. I mean, it was always on your mind because, hey, you're in the triangle. Um, but nothing, uh, we've had a few good storms. Um, and we do have a lot of bizarre things happen, which is equipment breaking down. Um, but, uh, no, I wasn't scared. I just, I, I was fascinated, just totally fascinated. It was like a dream come true as a producer director who's done so many shipwreck films. And then most of the time I'm, you know, staying on the ship, the divers go in and all you do is you sit there for hours waiting for them to come up and then they show you the footage to be able to get down into a submersible. And to go down and, and be like one foot away from a wreck that you're the first eyes in maybe 100 years on it. I mean, I get goosebumps now. And you'll see that in later episodes. In five and six, you see a lot of me because I'm going, I'm, I get the ability to go down in the submersible as well as on land, go and investigate other stories. So um, the series is quite unique and there's a different adventure um, every every week. And what does the crew consist of? Is there yourself, or two producers, and then there's two divers? Or, Well, no, there's um, basically I'm not producing this one. Um, I was a consultant, uh, did a lot of work um, in pre-production on it to solidify the stories. And then I'm one of the four, really four, five team members. So the lead guy is Michael Barnett, who's one of the, you know, best divers in Florida, and he's been searching for wrecks in this area um, for years with, of course, like us, we share the same dream of finding Flight 19 and the Mark Mariner. Mike Barnett and his team have been exploring a cluster of plane wrecks off the North Florida coast. One hurdle after another. First COVID, now there's hurricanes, and it just doesn't stop. So Michael, it's his map. Um, and again, he's, he's getting back to the fish again. A lot of the targets that he's collected over 30 years that he hasn't been able to check out, 
you know, a lot of them came from fishermen. Like he would go and talk to fishermen and the fishermen would snag something or they would notice that out in the middle of the ocean, there was a huge amount of fish in one little area. So Mike collected all of this stuff. So he's our, he's our main guy. You see Mike a lot. He's in the water. He dives. I mean, he's the one who found Challenger. Then there's uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, uh, Harris, um, who's our Air Force pilot, who's still, um, you know, working. Um, and uh, so anytime we find a plane, you know, Jason Harris comes and, and, uh, and helps us with the uh, identifying the plane. And then Professor David O'Keefe and I are the two true investigators. We're, we're doing everything from helping Mike identify the planes. And then we are kind of like the land crew and get to travel all over the place, interviewing very fascinating people and, you know, pulling the layers back in the story. So sometimes we're talking to an historian um, or we're investigating some of the bizarre occurrences like rogue waves, methane gas, and then we're talking to scientists. So Dave and I have kind of a fun, fun, a fun gig on, on the show because we get a bit of everything. And then I had the opportunity to go out on the, the research vessel and get, you know, and have the extraordinary opportunity to, uh, to be able to, you know, do some submersible dive. So a little bit of everything, but that's the main, uh, the, the main four um, investigators. That's amazing. It sounds like an incredible uh, series. And there's, there's uh, six ep episodes. Six episodes. Yes. The first one, of course, NASA kind of, you know, they had to break the news. Um, you know, you couldn't let this show just go to air without people knowing, especially for the families. And, so NASA broke the, you know, the big storyline, but there's still more in that, still more in the show besides Challenger, because you, you, in the first episode, you, you see from where the divers first find it, um, where they go back, where they go to NASA. We even meet a, a true astronaut, Bruce Melnick, who is a friend of Mike's, who came in and he was the first one to kind of identify it um, as Challenger, but we had to go to NASA to get it, you know, confirmed 100%. Um, and then there's a lot of other adventures, but the show, I think the second one, if, which comes up um, in a few days, uh, it's on sinkholes. And this is one of the stories I really wanted to do in press for it because I, when I did my um, Bermuda Triangle show a few years ago, it was called Drain the Bermuda Triangle, where we literally took, using high-end CGI, we took the water away from the triangle, and then we looked at the seabed to say, okay, does the seabed give us evidence of some of the strange occurrences? So it was a different take, but fascinating. But one of the areas I got to go was on Long Island in the Bahamas, where one of the most extraordinary geological features I've ever seen, and it's called Dean's Blue Hole. And a blue hole, a sinkhole, is basically an upside down cave. And Dean's Blue Hole, for the longest time, was the deepest sinkhole in the world at 600 plus feet. Um, they recently found one in China that I think is a thousand feet. So Dean's Blue Hole is the second deepest, but nobody's taken a camera down. So Dave and I go to the Bahamas and uh, we drop, uh, we have this um, cameraman technician with us and he brings a small ROV, remote operated vehicle, and we drop it into this like wicked hole. Like you understand, it's like you're standing on the beach and Dean's Blue Hole is maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 meters into the water and then it goes down 600 feet. So you're on a beach. And then all of a sudden there's this big dark hole and it's ominous and it's 600 feet down. It's one of the weirdest um, geological features I've ever seen. And at the same time, the dive team, they find a sinkhole out 40 miles off the coast of Jacksonville called Red Snapper Sinkhole. And they're the first ones to dive down about 400 feet. And they find, all I can say is they find something pretty crazy at the bottom. So that's, you know, that's our second episode. And then we come across plane wrecks and shipwrecks um, that we stumbled upon. Um, we have a list, not just a flight 19. There's a lot of like, once you start looking at the lost ships, especially from the 1920s and that, there's some fascinating stories where these ships just sailed off into the triangle and completely disappeared. Um, so we're always on the hunt for not just flight 19, but we also have a few other 
um, targets like uh, the SS Cyclops and um, the Hewitt. These are ships that, uh, that we want to find. So you'll have to watch the series to see if we find any of them. <laughs> but uh, but it's fun. It's just really, really fun. So six episodes, you know, we I think we deliver every episode. We give you something, you know, every episode that we find um, that I find is quite extraordinary. That's fantastic. Uh, that's great. Wayne. I, and Wayne, th- this is a whiskey fireside chat. I probably didn't tell you this. <laughs> Uh, need some whiskey. Uh, it's, it's too early for me to have in that, so I'll just cheer you. Uh, actually, I'll have this later on. It's it's a cheap blend. Oh, yeah, I got it on that's sale. Okay. <laughs> I will uh, have one later too. <laughs> okay. So the show is uh, the Bermuda Triangle into the cursed waters. Into cursed waters. Into so cursed waters. The Bermuda Triangle into cursed waters. It's a it's a great title. I. I didn't know about the title until about a month ago or even less because we were always just working on the two hour special that we did a year and a half ago, which was called Expedition Bermuda Triangle. And I thought, you know, I hope they go with something different. So whoever came up with Into Cursed Waters, I think is awesome because that's that's kind of totally the good description of what we were doing. That's fantastic. I'm look, really looking forward to it. And that, that I hope we're having more than just six I look, man, if people watch, there's a lot of buzz about it and we'd love to do season two. And all we know is that if we do season two, it'll be bigger and better. So hopefully um, more episodes and bigger adventures. You just got to find the UFO. If you find the UFO, it's a given. (laughs) Can't tell you. Can't tell you. You're going to have to watch all six to find out. But uh as I said, we touch on UAPs, and that's a fun episode, too, because the Pentagon did a big drop um, in 2018 of a lot of these classified, once classified documents of UAPs interconnected with, you know, sightings with the Air Force and Navy. So we had a, we had a lot of fun with that one. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think we touch on you know, a lot of the mysteries and legends and myths of the Bermuda Triangle. Awesomeness. Cheers. (laughs) Cheers then, Kevin.